welcome on in, guys. It is a book club night. Even though we are not doing book club, we are doing doc club. Um, we la- we finished Holly Madison's book, Down the Rabbit Hole, and recently had an interview with Jenny McCarthy on the podcast. So I figured since a Playboy has been a hot topic within our content lately, why don't we actually do an episode diving into the Secrets of Playboy documentary on A&E. So that is what we will be doing today. Sorry, I know I was a little late today, guys. So thank you for your patience. Um, but I hope you're ready. We got a lot to dive into tonight. Hopefully some of you got to see the documentary and you know a bit about what we're going to be chatting about in relation to Secrets of Playboy. Um, And if not, then I guess you don't have to see the documentary because I watched it for you. It's a very long documentary. So Amy released a new docu-series. It's titled Secrets of Playboy, and it dives into all of the dark shadow that covers the Playboy enterprise that was built by Mr. Hugh Hefner himself. So Playboy has since like distanced themselves from Hef. And after watching the doc, I can definitely see why, especially since I didn't really know. I'll be honest. I didn't know a whole ton about like Playboy and like the history of Playboy. And I even remember when Holly Madison came out with her book and I was one of those bitches that was just like, you know what? She knew what she was signing up for and how dare she try to come out and, and maybe there was some shady stuff, but who knows? Blah, blah, blah. Listen, I eat my words because the things that these women had to go through was awful and horrific. Um, And we're going to get into it. Playboy, uh, like I said, has since distanced themselves. They said that they've rebranded, they're restructuring, they're moving in a more positive direction to kind of get rid of that old image that they had with Hef. And we're going to dive into a lot of the stuff that Hef has been accused of, him and a lot of others. So the series is broken up into 12 parts. Some of it is a bit repetitive, so I'll try to skim through each part, and I'll just give you, like, the major revelations from each of them, because, like I mentioned, some of it does feel a little bit repetitive. It was very stretched out over all 12 of these parts. I would say it's more of 11 parts, because part 12 is more of, like, a reunion episode where they kind of, like, bring everybody together, Um, some, I believe, for the first time, but let's dive into it. So Hef really built himself as this pioneer in this sexual liberation movement, right? He was very like, free the nipple, but in this case, free it all. Like, mention it all, but without pants, right? If Bethany Frankel was going to do her mention it all moment, but she was like totally nude and posing in front of a photographer. So he wanted to show off women, but he really built up this idea of what it meant to be the girl next door, right? He loved that image. He seem to like really want to focus the the magazine on this like quintessential girl and what that meant so much so that they had a whole manifesto of what it meant to be the girl next door. Um, And like, it was, it was a very bizarre manifesto. Like they, some of the women read it and they talk about how like you have to be like really wholesome and really sweet and, you know, very like, like kind of shy, but like not like you weren't over the top. You kind of did, you're a good girl, right? You were young and you were skinny and you were pretty and you were clean with soap and water. It was just, I mean, they very much had an idea of what they wanted this girl next door to look like. So initially it was just nude women that would show off their breasts and it was very tasteful. Like that's the thing that I think Playboy tried to really um, pride themselves on was being more tasteful. So in this case, they didn't want to show like all, they didn't want to show the full cooch. They didn't want to show any cooch really. Um, And so it was really just showing your breasts and it was something that young women would aspire to be like aspire to have because they would see success from stars like Pamela Anderson and Anna Nicole Smith and Jenny McCarthy. And so they were like, Oh, they can go and pose for playboy and have these really big careers after. So a lot of these women aspire to do that. And they were being paid very well. I believe the rate was 15,000 for just like a newbie kind of coming in and posing for playboy. And so back then 15 grand was, was kind of like 15 grand today is kind of a lot. Like, I feel like I may even show my butt in a magazine for 15 grand. I feel like at this point I would hopefully not be in the amateur category and would maybe be in like the, you know, priority talent category that would get closer to that one mil mark. But, um, but listen, people would be making that on only fans these days. So they wanted to use Playboy and Hef to gain exposure and to gain new opportunities. And Playboy, like at the beginning, was initially described as kind of like this family. It was very inclusive. It was very freeing of the imagination, you know, a lead in the sexual revolution and own your body and own your sexuality. 
Hef even described the mansion as like Disneyland for adults. So they launched their first magazine with Marilyn Monroe. She was their first nude model. And that's what really helped kind of put them on the map because Marilyn Monroe was hot shit back in the day. So one thing, too, about Playboy was how progressive it was. Hef was always allowing women of different ethnic backgrounds to pose. Um, one of them, he was one of the few that was willing to um, put African-American people on his TV show back in the day, back when, like, segregation was still a big, strong thing, and they didn't want people um, of color on TV. And Hef was very much like, no, he put out this message of equality and acceptance and inclusivity. Somewhere along the line, that message got a little lost, if it was ever really there, and it wasn't all just for show and smoke and mirrors. But so half ended up like opening from the magazine. It led to these Playboy clubs that were like super exclusive, and you had to have like an actual key to get in. Um, and, and you had to like sign up to be a member, and you had to pay a member fee. And the bunnies, um, they would dress up like bunnies because half kind of liked, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't really understand what his obsession was with bunnies, but um, they would dress up and really kind of schmooze these guys and and treat them right, but or like make sure they were taken care of. But there was a very clear rule to all of the members that you were to look at the bunnies, but you were not to actually touch at the bunnies. You were to kind of just you know, they were the eye candy. And it ended up being like a very lucrative business for Playboy. They were never nude. They were always dressed up in their cute little outfits. Um, and it seems like from the start, the women really aspired to be playmates. And they were seemingly taken care of at the beginning. Where it appears to have gotten off track, though, is when Hef started to get this itch for fame and to stay relevant and to schmooze with celebrities. And with celebrities, anything goes. And they basically got whatever they wanted as long as they were kept happy. And this is where we see a lot of the allegations against like Bill Cosby come into play as women started to accuse him of assaulting them at the mansion on several occasions. Accusations that he still to this day denies. Um but Hef didn't really seem to care. He let them do whatever he wanted as long as he got to protect his image, protect the brand, and protect the celebrities that were coming in. That's all. That's what it was all about. That was the priority. They even had what was considered the cleanup crew, which is where the staff members that um, got down and dirty, they had to do whatever it took to protect that image and to make sure Hef was always taken care of and protected at the end of the day. So whether it was covering up an overdose or concealing details of like a suicide or even just keeping blackmail on any on everyone in case Hef ever had to use it to save himself, they did whatever Hef wanted them to do. It's part of what people believe was his pull over celebs like John Travolta and Bill Cosby. Um, because, you know, what happens at the mansion only stays at the mansion if you play by Hef's rules. He was definitely a fame whore, Robin. Definitely a fame whore. Um but the rules were always evolving and they never seemed to meet Hef's like insatiable appetite. And the fame aspect of Playboy is I think where Hef really seems to have lost himself. He did have a brief period where he tamed down a bit and got married, but that quickly turned into the 2000s rebrand of Playboy. And then eventually the introduction of cyber and like video content um, of the women nude. And then eventually it led to the girls next door, which kind of took him back into that world of fame. So let's break down each of the 12 parts. I'll try to skim to skim through them and only give you like the juiciest parts of it. Cause like I said, a lot of it can be a little bit repetitive. Um, but let me just give a couple of shout outs before we dive in. Hi, Lauren, Marilyn Monroe did not pose for Playboy. Hef bought the pictures from the photos. Oh, interesting. I must've missed that from the documentary, Lauren. I mean, I guess the way that they portrayed it was Marilyn, um, she is what helped Playboy kind of become, you know, the big credible magazine that it ended up becoming because they had her photos. But it, I mean, that is possible. I may have missed that in the documentary. Yeah, we'll definitely get into the dog stuff, Monique. Hi, Angie. Hi, Red Sox, Sarah. Hi, Elaine. Hi, Miss Redhead. Hi, Gloria. Aaron D. What's going on? Aaron D. Mary Ann Stout. What's up? Katie Alt, Jennifer Blakey. What's going on? What's going on, guys? Hi, Coffee Buzz. Okay. Thank you guys for joining tonight's book club. Hopefully you have a little, little sippy sippy with you. I put mine on a little ice because it was hot. Mm. <sighs> okay. Let's get into part one, the Playboy legacy. So this part really focuses on Hef building the Playboy empire. 
he was a bit of a loner growing up. So this kind of takes us through him creating the movement of sexual liberation and finding his power as like a young entrepreneur with this Playboy magazine that ultimately catapulted into this big enterprise that we know of today. Part two, this gets into um, part two is titled The Girl Next Door. And so this part really focuses on Holly Madison and basically is one of Hef's most famous and prominent girlfriends. Obviously, we know he was married a couple of times. He's dated many different girls. But I think Holly Madison, aside from Bridget and Kendra, thanks to the show and thanks to like her celebrity fame after the show. And she was one of the longest running girlfriends as well. This part really focuses on her presumably to hook people into the series because Holly Madison was one of the more prominent famous girlfriends that it just kind of makes sense. A lot of the stories she covers in her book down the rabbit hole are kind of just regurgitated here again. Um, it talks about how in the early two thousands, Hef really needed a way to rebrand himself and the girls next door. The reality show really uh, helped him do that. We know it featured Holly and Bridget Marquardt and Kendra Wilkinson, his three girlfriends at the time. So this really helps kind of bring, playboy back into the forefront bridget's also featured in this episode kendra's not in it at all she declined to participate but bridget's participation very slim um and as she described in heather mcdonald's juicy scoop podcast a lot of what they used of her interview was really just to kind of support holly's stories and what holly claims happened to her at the playboy mansion where Br bridget was like most of my time there and most of my experiences were great and pleasant um, but they didn't seem to want to use any of that. They really just wanted to focus on how dark Playboy was. But we broke down all of Holly's stories in book club, and I don't feel like she really revealed anything that we haven't already discussed. So I think we'll just jump right into part three. And part three is called The Bunnies in the Cleanup Room. This is where we learn about the club uh, or the Playboy clubs and how they started to pop up throughout the country. This is where they were super exclusive and the rules for the men were very strict. However, the rules for the women were even stricter. They had to weigh in. They had to keep insanely skinny. They had to keep a very tight shape. Um, and they had to jump through these crazy hoops to maintain that good girl image. They had to perfect the bunny dip, which is like this, um, this like leaning backwards sort of motion that they would have to do when they would take your order, when they would bring you their drinks. Um, it was their signature move. And it was apparently very challenging for them to do too because they were in these tight like corset dresses and they were wearing these heels. So like to have to do these moves, I guess, was a bit of a challenge. So, but a lot of the women... Um, like wanted to be wanted to be one of the bunnies because it led to so many different opportunities and it was great pay and they were treated, you know, like a goddess essentially. But a lot of the girls, once you pull back the curtain, a lot of them would complain of getting like kidney infections because of how tight their uniform had to be. And so they had to like suck in all of their like internal organs. Um, and if they couldn't fit into their outfits and they were done, you weren't put on the, you weren't put on the, um, the roster for the week. And if you couldn't come back and make weight, you were done, you were cut, you were over. You either aged out or you weighed out. And once that happened, you were no longer a playmate. But it's interesting because some of the women that they show in this part of the documentary or in the part of the docuseries, rather, they still have their uniforms and talk about like what an incredible experience they had, despite, you know, the near impossible beauty standards that they had to meet. Many of these women really loved it. And they say that it changed their lives. It did, however, start to get dark when the men would try to take advantage of the women outside of the clubs. So they were always protected inside the clubs, right? And so the bunny manager, uh, she got to kind of make sure everyone was taken care of and the rules were followed. But once the women left for the night, they were essentially on their own and half didn't care to provide them any sort of protection after that. And there were many reports of women get it, getting assaulted late at night, having to walk to their cars. Um, this is where the cleanup crew came in. This is where security and personal staff and club staff, they had to do whatever they had to protect the image of the brand. So sometimes that involves silencing girls. Um, there are accounts of witnessing girls overdose and like disposing of them and they were never to be seen again. They would prevent women from going to the hospital. So have had his own private doctor on staff. So if they needed anything, they would go to the Playboy doctor instead of having, having to go to the actual doctor. He even allegedly bought off cops to have them on his side as well if he ever needed to activate that. 
many of the people in the dock that have come forth now regret their actions. And you can just see the guilt on their, their face. Like you can tell, like some of them are crying and it's hard because it's like, but what you guys did was awful. And like, you didn't protect these women. You didn't stop this from happening. But at the same time, like Hef was very rich and very powerful and he would threaten people. And he wouldn't just be like, I'm threatening to cut you off. He would threaten to ruin their lives. And I think he was very good at manipulating people and making them believe that their life was, could only be good with him there. He was very good at collecting those types of people. I think the people that saw him for who he really was would just dip out and disengage and not participate or not be involved in any of his like playboy empire or they knew how to keep an arm's distance but i think the people that he got to come in were people that were looking for a family that were looking for a sense of community that were damaged or you know were easy to take advantage of and once he made them feel special which he did with a lot of the women he would make them feel special and then he would manipulate them and use them and use their insecurities against them he did that it seems like he did that with a lot of like the staff there as well and they came to like love him maybe it was like stockholm syndrome i'm not really sure but they were definitely loyal which brings us to part four the price of loyalty so this part heavily focuses on barbie uh, sorry bobby armstein um half secretary and she's the one who went down for the whole playboy drug ring operation he loved his drugs everyone knows half loved a pill half loved whatever he could get his hands on um and once a, a bunny overdosed which um the fuzz was eventually trying to 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 squeeze in on him and they were trying to come after half but so one of the bunnies ended up overdosing and instead of um they wanted to come after half so they started to go after some of the people around half but they were all very loyal to him and this is where bobby ended up being the fall girl but when you work for him you're loyal baby and you got to ride all the way to the end and that's what bobby did so she took the bullet to protect half and ultimately ended up committing suicide as a result of it because she was going down they were ready to, to lock her up it seems like half liked you until you were a liability and once you were a liability he ditched you like that and that was it you were done and that seemed to have been the case with bobby and i think as a woman she was like i was so loyal and i was so good i mean this is my own sort of speculation based off of what i saw in the documentary and kind of what the experience was as people were describing it in the documentary it seemed like she kind of felt a little betrayed because she's like i was loyal to you and i was good to you and now i'm going down for this and i shouldn't go down for this so she took the only way out she knew how but there were lots of stories of drug abuse, particularly cocaine and amphetamines. Apparently, have had a whole drawer full of his bedroom, full, uh, full of drugs in his bedroom. Literally, an entire drawer full. Obviously, we know about the quaaludes, and we know um, we know that um, he would use them to like lure girls. He called them thigh openers, as Holly described in her book. Uh, Jennifer in the live chat is saying, "I think he had Bobby." and made it look like a suicide. I mean, that's possible too. I, it's Listen, I wouldn't put anything past them at this point, you know? I would not put anything past him at this point. He was a sick dude. Yes, he was, Robin. Yes, he was. Elaine says, it sounded like a new documentary that has been on Different House, though. Yeah. Monique says, he loved his quaaludes. That he did. He never took them, though. He loved to give them. He was the dealer. Okay, this is where we get into part five. And this is where I'm going to warn you guys. This is where it starts to get really dark. Um, and it's just like, because like, I, I watched the first four parts and I'm like, okay, this is bad. This is rough. You know, the bunnies and the, the you know, kidney infections. Okay, Bobby. Okay. You know, she ended up being so loyal that she was ride or die. Literally ride till she died. Um, but the circus, part five is called the circus. Hi, Siki. So Hef began to become pretty desensitized to a lot of the happenings at Playboy and a lot of the Playboy content. So he needed to up the ante, right? His appetite never really seemed to be satisfied and it seemed like he always wanted more. This is where we hear a lot from his girlfriend or his ex-girlfriend, Sandra. She talks about how he would make her engage in orgies. She had never had a threesome, but he made her participate in her first one and she was very against it. She's like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. He's like, come on, come on, come on. He would always like force her to do things that were beyond her comfort zone, but she always like just wanted to be a good girlfriend and give him whatever she wanted because he had that allure. And she says that when she first came to Playboy, he made her feel special and he made her feel chosen. So she she wanted to make sure she 
pleased him, you know? And so she's like, fine, I'll do it. And if I don't like it, then I won't do it again. And he's like, okay, fine. That's all I need is for you to agree to it one time. Dun, dun, dun. Well, ultimately, it wasn't just one time. It became a several time thing. And he kept pushing her to do this. Um, and then it ultimately led to her having a drug addiction because she's like, I needed to be drugged and I needed to be high the entire time um, because it was just so, so heavy. And she's like, I couldn't be present for it anymore. I had to just be high and it was the only way I was able to do it. But then she felt bad because she's like, but because I was high and it desensitized me, then it made me an enabler, right? Um, Chow Britt says, I thought I watched all the episodes, but I think I have two left of the Playboy documentary. The last two are the last one I wasn't fully engaged with because it was kind of just like a reunion episode that rehashed a lot of what we had already detailed and it brought a lot of the women together. Um, so it wasn't anything, and it was kind of just like their reactions to the reception from the Playboy documentary coming out. Um, the episode 11, though, that's where the Shannon twins come out, and that one's actually pretty good. Jenny wants to know, is the documentary free to watch on any platforms? I believe if you have uh, Hulu Live, you can watch it. I watched it on Peacock. I I think I have the premium subscription, but I also believe it's available for free on Peacock. So that's how I watched it was on Peacock. I know it originally aired on a and &E. I'm pretty sure A&E has an on-demand documentary or an on-demand on -demand app that you can you can utilize. But back to Sandra, his girlfriend. So she said that she felt pressure to make him happy until she became an enabler herself. And then she would help rally people for his orgies. She said that she'd never been exposed to so much. Um, so much to the point where she says that she was helping to organize five orgies a week, five a week. That is a lot of stamina. That is a lot of Viagra. But his security describes them having these nights called pig nights. And this is where his buddies would come over and perform with the girls or have these girls perform for them. The staff would have to go and find girls. Sandra would have to go and find girls, whether it was like at clubs or at the Playboy Mansion parties. They would find these girls that were vulnerable and pretty enough for half. And then they would bring them up for what he described as his pig nights. None of the security was allowed to call the girls pigs. Only Hef was allowed to call them pigs. So why he called them pigs, I don't really know. Um, that's kind of unclear. Oh, trust me, it gets worse. So nothing was ever enough for Hef, so much to the point where we have a story of this adult actress, Linda Lovelace, okay? She was brought to the mansion. Um, seemingly for one of these pig nights, she was brought into the mansion and she was already pretty lit when she got there and she ended up getting drugged. And this is where Hef and his pals made her go down and perform oral on a German shepherd. And apparently Hef wasn't against that. They pull interview clips of him talking about, you know, bestiality and how he's kind of open to that. Should he ever want to engage in that? Um, that, you know, he didn't know when that when it was time to draw that line and have recorded everything and he filmed everything. And we know Holly Madison mentioned in her book where she was uh, organizing some of half stuff and she found a videotape called um, Girl and Dog. And she's like, I didn't even want to watch it. I didn't even want to know what it was. I just discarded of it because I could only imagine what it was. It seems like this may have been that tape um, because like we know he recorded everything in the mansion, everything in the bedroom. Most people had no idea that they were being filmed in the bedroom until afterwards. And then he'd be, he would tell them he has tapes on them and he would use it as blackmail. And he loved having this like sick sense of control and power. But I mean, I'm pretty, I don't even know if Linda was even aware of what was going on when she was there doing this. It's awful. I'm telling you it, it gets heavy and it gets dark. Um, so if you don't want to watch the documentary, I don't blame you at all. I really don't. Um, I'm drinking out of my Emily D. Baker Lawn Nerd um, tumbler. Keeps things hot and cold. So chic. So chic. Okay, let's get into part six. Part six is called The Corporate Game. This is where we focus a lot on Mickey Garcia. And Mickey Garcia was the former head of promotions at Playboy. She started out as a model. And then after seeing how poorly a lot of the playmates and these women were treated, she quickly tried to climb up, 
climb her way up the corporate ladder and worked very hard to become head of promotions because she wanted to help protect these women as best as she could. And a lot of the women say that like when she came into Playboy, they felt a lot safer and they felt like somebody was there because she was a bit of a ball buster and she did not let people get into um, like she didn't let these guys get away with it. Um, his longtime partner, I was convinced after hearing about the shrine. Yeah, we'll get into all of that stuff, guys. We'll jump, we'll dive into each episode. We'll get into every single bit of those pieces. And then if there's anything that I missed, we can go back over it. Um, but so Mickey work, they would do so the playmates when they would be playmate of the month or playmate of the year, or sometimes just models in the magazine, they would have to do promo events where they would do like magazine signings and different appearances in different cities throughout the country. And men would often at these events try to take advantage of them. And in some cases they would abuse them. So sometimes though they were booked for gigs. It seemed like as time was going on, the gigs went from being like promo events to being private events. And these gigs seemed to be more like these girls were being pimped out by these high rollers who really just wanted to spend a night with them. Um, Mickey even explains how she was raped through Playboy. And so it's part of the reason she stepped up because she wanted to make sure she protected the other younger, vulnerable girls. But in order to be an exec, you still have to play the game, which meant the men rule. They made up the rules. They did what they want. The female execs also never got an opportunity to co-mingle with each other. They were always separated, seemingly to protect the men from uh, preventing them from sharing any stories with each other or banding together against them. It's like kind of keep all the girls in the different corners. That way they can't come together and stand up for themselves. Um, and half knew how the bunnies were being abused. Those are the claims that some of the, the staff makes that he knew. Mickey claims he knew what was going on. He wanted no part of it because if he knew or if it was public that he knew, then he would then somehow be held accountable. And this is where the cleanup crew had to make sure everything was handled. Part seven is called the Playboy Lie. And this is the era where Playboy really started a struggle as competition was starting to come out. We had Hustler come to the forefront. We had Penthouse come to the forefront. They were all trying to pave way, which was hurting Playboy's bottom line because Hustler and Penthouse, they were more graphic. They were showing full cooch, right? And Half was against showing full cooch. He was also, he was definitely against showing full bush, but Hustler and Penthouse, nothing was off limits. They were giving you up inside the cooch. You could see the uterus in Hustler and in Penthouse. So he wanted to maintain this squeaky, like, girl next door image. Um, but eventually he had to buckle and start to go with the times and start to go with the competition. So he also broke into the cyberspace. But this is where we get into the NDAs and the releases that they would make these women sign. Many of these girls were young and naive, so they would just kind of sign whatever Playboy wanted them to because it was out of trust and ambition. And they, you know, obviously had their eyes set on having this, you know, Jenny McCarthy and a Nicole Smith career that Playboy could build for them. And Playboy would sell them on that. They'd be like, listen, we're going to change your life. And so they'd be like, all right, let me sign it away. But it also meant that Playboy owned all of those images. And at this time, they were also starting to film these like behind the scenes videos because like I said, half filmed everything. So they would film behind the scenes videos from their shoots. And once um, Playboy, you know, obviously they picked which photos they wanted to be on the cover, which photos they wanted to be on the magazine. Um, well, when Playboy was hurting, they would start to sell the discarded photos, the leftover photos. They would sell them to these explicit adult sites without the girl's permission or even their knowledge because they signed their release. So Playboy owned the images and could do whatever they wanted with them. So they went from being playmates to being full-on porn stars. And it was really just any way for Hef and, and Playboy to be able to make a buck. So he did not care. He literally would sell these all of their photos onto these different sites. And then everything was up there. All the outtakes, which were a lot more explicit. Obviously the magazine was a lot more tasteful. So when they're picking three or four high quality images that are tasteful of you kind of covering yourself up, that's one thing. But when, you know, you're caught off guard or there's something that's captured that maybe was a little too explicit for the magazine that's now available on the internet for everyone to find and to also find under your name, not even under a fake name, because at least porn stars, they have fake names. 
in this case, these women's lives were all out there. Their business was all out there. But this was around the same time that Mickey, Mickey herself, she was like, I'm fed up with this. I'm fed up with half. I'm fed up with these antics. So she ended up leaving Playboy and publicly outing all of the bad deeds that she ended up witnessing at Playboy. And she got a lot of backlash for it. Dude, stop rambling about shit you don't know. You weren't there. You sound crazy. Um, Michelle, this is uh, this is the 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 book club. This is uh, a recap of Secrets of Playboy. So we're going part by part. I'm not rambling about anything. I'm recapping what we saw in the documentary. So you're more than welcome to stay, Michelle, or you're more than welcome to head on out. Um, but we're gonna dive into part eight next. So part eight is called Predators Ball. And here's where we get to know more about one of the girls that committed suicide. So when it came out in the press, what was left out was that she had a wall of photos of Hef where she essentially called him a monster. And so it seems that her death was part of this bigger statement that she was trying to make. Some believe that she may have been drugged and raped by Bill Cosby, who was one of the biggest offenders at the time. And Bill got away with a lot, right? So she ends up committing suicide. She ends up writing this message on the wall with all of these photos of Hef, um, basically implying that he was awful, you know, and he took advantage of girls or whatever statement she was trying to make that got missed in the press. It was very much covered up, which goes back to the point of Hef trying to um, buy off or trying to control the narrative by buying off the cops. And so even though it leaked in the press that a playmate had committed suicide, all these other details about the message and her suicide note, all of that was left out until recently. And now people are like, we knew what happened and this was her story. And we're glad that her story now gets to actually be told, but they tried to link her to Bill Cosby. And so if you were famous, Hef wanted to keep you around because he was obsessed with fame and he would essentially, or he would basically protect you to keep you around. No matter how many infractions you committed, that's what the cleanup crew's job was, right? They handled it. They took care of it. They made sure everybody was clean at the end of it. There's even an instance where two of the models were kidnapped and like locked away before Playboy had to come and rescue them and then ultimately silence them and prevent them from going to the press. Dark, crazy what some of these men were able to get away, to get away with. I can hear a pin drop. Yeah burn bill yeah but it's interesting bill cosby still denies all of this ever happening and a lot of the accusations go against him but he have kept him around because he was bill cosby it's insane it's it's truly truly wild um much love zach thank you for your time thank you muddy grace i appreciate that have just wanted to stay relevant yeah jennifer it sounds just like it i mean sheesh um Watch the doc and stop being me. Yes, watch the dog and stop being me. Or stay around and have a good time. All I'm doing is recapping it. So for those of us that watched it and want to chat about it, that's what we're here to do. And for those that don't want to watch it but want the recap, that's what I'm here for. Um, I love Zach. He says what I say. He literally researched and gets all the facts and says what other people don't. Thank you, Chow Bray. I appreciate that. The podcast is very, oh, this podcast is very interesting. Thank you, my dear. Um, ooh, nice tan. Thank you. It's all fake. Um, okay. <laughs> fake like the Playboy Mansion. Um, okay. So then we get into part nine. And part nine is called the Shadow Mansions. And here's where we learn about all of Hef's buddies, his circle jerk buddies, right? One in particular was Mark Sagnor. So somebody mentioned his lover. This is where we get into that. So uh, Hef's personal doctor and BFF Mark lived at the mansion with him. His daughter even grew up at the mansion. She's interviewed a lot throughout the documentary as well. And his daughter actually reveals that she believes that they had a sexual relationship together and that they were secret lovers. I mean, maybe not even so much secret lovers because some of the staff there was like, yeah, we kind of knew that there was a thing going on, but like we didn't bad any eyes like he literally had seven girlfriends at one time you know with his wife living in the house next door and his two kids there they're like we didn't question anything the doctor was there for a very long time um 
and Hef's been open about his like willingness to have exploration with his sexuality and, and his exploration with homosexuality. And apparently Hef and Mark were very closely intimate until Mark got excommunicated for his involvement in harming some girls that happened at one of these shadow mansions. It seems like Mark ended up being a fall guy at these shadow mansions. Wow. Angela, Angela dropped a super duper chat on YouTube. We appreciate you. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate you. That is a very generous, generous um, super sticker. And I appreciate it. That's part of the reason I was, I was a little late today, guys. I was trying to make sure my notes were all together because I didn't want to go episode by episode. And then, then I had to. So I was like, there's so much in here. Um, and I appreciate that. Thank you guys. I appreciate the love, the sweet comments, the super stickers, the super chats, the badges on Instagram. You guys are awesome. And I really appreciate you. This podcast is twofold watching Zach's beauty and getting the lowdown of this show that we are all too disgusted to watch. I mean, it's heavy. Like I said, the first four parts, I was kind of like, oh, okay, I, I get it. Cause some people are like, you can't watch it all in one city. Like you have to really take it in doses. And once we got to part five, that's when I was like, okay, this shit's getting a little too dark. Um, but yes, so let's get into the Shadow Mansion. So for many of the women that didn't make it into the magazine or into the world of Playboy, many around half would host these parties with these girls that were much smaller and seemingly much darker. So the way it's described in the documentary is it's like Playboy wanted the girls that were a 10, right? And sometimes if you were like an eight or a nine, then they could squeeze you into some of the cyber content or, you know, maybe you didn't get a full pictorial, but they could utilize you in some way. But the girls that were seven and below, that's where these other guys would come in and be like, okay, well, I can't touch the playmates. I can't, you know, go all the way. Those are Hef's girls. So we're going to go with these other girls that are essentially playboy re rejects. Those aren't my words. That's kind of how the, they're described as kind of the rejects, right? Um, so for many of the women that didn't make it, they would then get lied to by these other men that were like, oh, I'm a modeling scout and I'm going to have this modeling party so you can come and test for my agency and come over to the parties and kind of hang out with us and, you know, see what, see if I can get you, book you some gigs, if not for Playboy, maybe somewhere else. And so this was around the time that Hef had married his wife, Kimberly Conrad. And so around this time, Hef had really settled down. No more orgies, no more bringing girls upstairs. Like he really was a lot tamer, which is why all of these other guys, they missed these crazy wild playboy parties. They missed pig night. So they started to go off and do their own thing because they're like, okay, well, Hef's a little busy and he's at the mansion. The mansion's occupied. So let me divvy out and do our own thing, right? And this is what Jenny McCarthy described when she was on the podcast um, last month when I had her on and I was chatting with her. She says that she was there around the time he was married to Kimberly Conrad and it was very buttoned up. It was very straight laced. You know, it was, um, you know, nobody was really engaging in these crazy wild orgies that you would hear of, right? So while Hef was on his more tame path, his pal still wanted to play and capitalize off of Playboy and the empire that Hef built, which was like the sexual revolution. Um, and Hef acted like he had no clue what was going on, but the staff's like, uh-uh. Hef always acted like he didn't know what was going on, but Hef always knew what was going on because his security and his staff always made sure he had full reports of what was happening. And I guess to me, it sounded like he wanted to know everything was happening so that he could stay one step ahead. And if he could distance himself from certain players and kind of keep an eye on them from afar or see who was capitalizing off of him or whatever, he acted like he had no clue, but he, he knew everything was going on. And so these shadow mansions, these mini mansions, they would have these fake photo shoots and they would essentially drug and assault these women. And many of these women were left scarred. You know, there's, I believe one instance where, um, one girl overdosed and was found in the bathroom and was discarded of, or I mean, who knows what happened to her, but she was never seen again. Nobody ever heard from her again. Her dad claimed that she went missing. Um, it's dark. It's dark. And this is like what the cleanup crew had to do. But so there ended up being a crackdown on these shadow mansions and some of the dark deeds that were happening there. And this led to Mark uh, Hef's doctor slash BFF slash 
secret lover, he ended up getting in trouble legally because he ended up having to be the fall guy. And I think they probably went after him hoping that he would turn on Hef. Um, and I think he was hoping that Hef would come in to rescue him because he loved Hef. But the opposite happened and Hef ended up cutting him off completely. And Mark was devastated. And he was essentially kind of kicked out because he got caught and your job is not to get caught. You're not supposed to get caught. So it was like, well, did Hef really love him if he was able to just kick him to the curb so easily? So it's interesting, though, because as somebody mentioned in the live chat, too, on Instagram, at his wedding, because Mark eventually ended up marrying a woman down the line, at his wedding, he had like this odd shrine to Hugh Hefner after he had passed away basically honoring Hef, even though it didn't seem like they were close in those final years after all. But that's why the daughter's like, I think they definitely had some sort of lover's situation. Yes, then Mark got married and had a shrine of Hef at his wedding. His own daughter said that he was in love with Hef. I mean, it's not a far off. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think Hef loved, I don't think Hef has ever loved anyone. I think Hef loved the idea of people being in love with him. And I don't think it mattered who it was, whether it was his wife, whether it was one of his girlfriends, or whether it was his boyfriend, like whoever it was. It's interesting because it really made me think about Hef. And I was like, well, was Hef secretly gay? Was Hef asexual in some way? Because it seemed like more than Hef wanted to be in love or wanted any sort of intimacy, he definitely didn't want to be alone, but he loved power. And he especially loved having power over women, which made me really think, huh, maybe he actually kind of hated women or resented women in some way. Like maybe he was asexual. Um, I don't know. I'm curious what your guys thoughts are, if you have any theories, but you know, it's interesting because a lot of the stories in the series talk about how Hef really just liked to watch more than he liked to participate. And he loved to film and record in order to blackmail people, which makes me think that there was probably something deeper going on there. If he wasn't, I mean, I guess when we hear about like the girls next door days, like they would all kind of talk, talk about how they would each kind of give him one minute of their time and then hop off and on to the next. But there's never, and I don't ever remember hearing their stories of him actually climaxing, um, which is interesting. So I'm just curious as to like, what could be in the psyche there? Like, is it asexual? Was he secretly gay and just kind of repressing those feelings? Um, or was he just a total narcissist that loved when people were in love with him. Don't forget his younger years. We only saw him on TV being old. Yeah. A lot, a lot about a lot going on in the younger years. Um, he gave a lot of interviews before. Um, it seemed like the way they described his upbringing was he was very um, like young and nerdy and didn't have a lot of friends, which is why he had this ambition to become famous, to be important, to be somebody and to have some sort of legacy. He had so many girls. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he did. But my part, my my curiosity is, it's like, did he have these girls because he liked them and wanted to be with them, or did he have them just to have power over them so that he could control them and manipulate them? I think there was something deeper going on. I am very curious if you guys have any thoughts or theories of your own for those of you that did watch the series, or for those of you that are kind of listening in. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, guys, be sure to smash the like button. Subscribe if you like this content. We do have a couple more parts that we'll break down um, up next. But I just wanted to say, if you're enjoying it, smash the like button. Drop a comment with your theory below if you're in the replay crew. And be sure to hit subscribe. Also, guys, um, I just i am launching um, uh, members-only subscriptions. Since we normally don't do documentaries or different series recaps. It's always book clubs that we do every Tuesday. I figured since there was so much interest in Secrets of Playboy, maybe I'll do like the Army Hammer, Army Hammer documentary. And so that'll be part of like some of the special members only content. Um, so I just, I'm launching memberships this week on the YouTube channel. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can go to youtube.com slash just plain Zach, youtube.com slash just plain Zach. Um, and you can sign up today. It's only two ninety nine a month. I make it super cheap. All the after parties I'm going to move over for members only. So we'll do at least two after parties a month. And I figured we'll do more of these deep dives into these different docu-series shows. 
I think Army Hammer might be next. I'm thinking for our next book club, we might kick off the Meghan Markle books. I've heard that's really juicy. So if you guys are interested, no pressure at all. I just love the support. But thank you, Mel. Mel Navarro. It's Mel Navarro. Sent her first badge. Yes. Thank you, Mel Navarro. Well, if you guys do want to join our special members only YouTube for the special exclusive Zach Pack content, then you can head over to youtube.com slash just plain Zach and hit the join now button. There's no pressure. But if you guys want to, oh, look at that. Miss Redhead just joined as a member. Woo woo. Miss Redhead in the house. Yeah. Let's get it, get it, get it, honey. I love it. Thank you guys. That's so sweet. Miss Redhead is officially a member. I love it. Okay, let's dive into part 10. I don't want to pressure you guys or like sell you guys on anything, but I just wanted to throw that out there if anybody wants to join. We'll do after parties. We'll do also, oh, yay. MD just joined as a member. Yes. Oh my God, you guys are so sweet. Thank you. I love you and I appreciate you. Okay, part 10. Part 10 is called The Number One Predator, and this gets deeper into all of Hef's misdeeds. Here we learn more about the quaaludes that Hef, um, who he would allegedly give the women to make them feel more comfortable. We know he called them thigh openers. Woo, woo, look at Sarah Bahu just got, just joined the membership. Sarah Bahu, let's get it, get it, get it. Oh, oh my God, I love it. Okay. So part 10 really focuses on Hef and all of his misdeeds. Um, he basically liked to have his way with women, whatever he wanted, however he wanted, whenever he wanted. They talk a lot about Mary O'Connor. We saw her on Girls Next Door. Um, here it gets brought up a lot that she was essentially like a pimp and a protector of Hef, and she would do whatever she had to do to protect him and keep him safe which is interesting. Um, Holly seems to have a very different recollection of Mary and seemed to really like Mary. And even when she left the mansion and um, needed somewhere to stay here in Los Angeles, Mary took Holly in. So it's interesting that, you know, Mary is brought up a lot. Nobody has anything nice to say about Mary in all 12 parts of the documentary. I will say that. And it seemed like she was essentially Hef's keeper. Um, Dorothy Stratton, her murder comes up a couple of times, but is more prominently focused in part 10. She was described as like the perfect playmate, but she had a crazy ex. He was obsessed with her and he ultimately ended up murdering her before committing suicide. So it was a lover's quarrel, you know, murder suicide combo. Um, and apparently Hef and the people around Hef, I believe it was Mickey who told Hef, she's like, hey, she's in a really bad position. She has this guy that's obsessed with her. Playboy's making a lot of money off of her. I think we need to keep her. Yes, Mary has passed away, but this was prior. Mary's passed away since then. But Mary is brought up a lot in the documentary as being like Hef's keeper. Um, and Holly did live with Mary back when she first left the Playboy mansion because Holly talks about it, that in her book. So... Dorothy Stratton, Mickey, and some of the other people around Heifer, like, we need to take care of her. We need to do something. You know, you, we're calling her the perfect playmate, and we're making a ton of money off of her, yet we don't have any protection for any of these women. So Hef knew that Dorothy was in a really tough position, um, but refused to help her out. He only Hef only cared about Hef. So ultimately, when she ended up passing away, it was it was awful. It was dark. That also kind of made the headlines. That also made news. But it was just, you know, it was awful. Um, it seemed like Hef didn't really care about protecting any of these girls. He cared about making money off of them and exploiting them, but never had any intention of actually doing anything to help them or further their careers, as these girls were often promised when they would come to Playboy. In part 11, this one's called Behind the Girls Next Door, and this is a sit down with the Shannon twins. So remember after Holly, Kendra, and Bridget left, Carissa and Christina, Shannon, the two twins end up coming into the Playboy Mansion. So they talk about how they were manipulated into joining the Playboy Mansion, how they were being sought after when they were 17, and then right at 18, they were called up ready to come in and pose for Playboy. And they were just excited about the opportunity because they didn't, they came from simple means. They're like, we didn't even know what it meant to like bleach our hair. So they came in, they posed for Playboy, Hef liked them and invited them to come stay at the mansion. And they remember going for the first time because they were brought in 
um, I believe for some sort of like special pictorial that was happening that was part of Girls Next Door season five. And Holly talks about this a lot too, how, you know, this was kind of like a fake scene. This pictorial was kind of staged for the show because Holly at this point was already planning to leave. Well, they remember meeting Holly and they said that Holly was really cold and that Holly was really fake and that everything at the Playboy Mansion just seemed very staged for the reality show and none of it seemed very real. And they didn't believe that Kendra, Bridget, or Holly were even really interested in half. And when Hef invited them to be his girlfriends, they were just like, oh, yeah, we'll totally be your girlfriends. Like, that'll be cool. Like, what, we just get to come and film this reality show? They thought it was all fake. They thought it was all staged. They didn't know that any of these women had to actually sleep with Hugh Hefner. So they moved in as Holly, Bridget, and Kendra were phasing and moving out. And they said that at first, they didn't really have to do anything, but that eventually on their 19th birthday, because remember, they posed when they were 18, and it all happened very quickly. So as they were, it was a few months after turning 18 that they had officially moved in and become girlfriends. And on their 19th birthday, this is when they all went out. They were partying. Um, and they claimed that Kendra, this is where they call out Kendra. They came, Kendra was like, hey, do you guys want to smoke some weed? And they're like, yeah, we want to smoke some weed. So Kendra's like, okay, let's go up to Hef's room, smoke some weed. And so Kendra took them upstairs to go and smoke weed and then ended up ditching them and totally bailed on them. And they were like, uh, why are we left here alone with half? And that's when half's like, here, take this pill. You'll feel better. They did. So he ended up drugging them and making them sleep with him. And they said that they were super disgusted by it because they were sisters. Like, could you imagine having sex with an old man who they described as like being like sleeping with their grandpa? They were like, I don't understand why. Like they were like, so like caught off guard by it. And they're like, it was our 19th birthday. Like we never forgot that experience. Like you'd never want to sleep with your sister, let alone have sex, like perform head on a dude in front of your sister. Like, it's just, it's weird. It's bizarre. And they were just like, it was so twisted, but we were so faded at that point. And we were just like, so confused. And I assume betrayed by Kendra, they felt. It was wild. Um, but then eventually, you know, like Bridget described, once you do it for the first time, you're just like, okay, I guess this is just my life now. Like you feel like you compromise your morals and you make a deal with the devil and you're just like, well, shit, I already did it one time. I'm going to milk this opportunity for all I've got. And if I did it once, I can do it again. And I'm going to make sure I can really get everything that I can get out of this. Um Playboy then media trained them so that when they would do interviews, they were able to avoid questions like about incest because they wanted no part of that narrative and they wanted to protect half from being part of that narrative. So the girls were media trained on how to answer certain questions or how to avoid certain questions. One of the twins, Carissa, claims that she got pregnant by half and had to have a secret abortion um, and had to do it alone because she couldn't be seen out with her sister because then they were afraid the paparazzi were going to find them. And so she details that experience and having to hide it from people and having to do promo shoots for the girls next door and hide that she had just had an abortion, even though she had like a bloated stomach and was bleeding everywhere and how her twin sister, they had to use her body for a body double um, because they couldn't use her actual body. They could only use her face. Wild. Kendra denies that's the way that it happened. Yeah, I'm sure Kendra does. I mean, here's the thing. They all have very different recollections of what they think happened. Um, the twins claim to still have PTSD to this day, and they also claim that they haven't dated anybody to this day since half. And I went and looked at their Instagram profiles, and it seems like they're very still troubled by it. I mean, listen, these girls were kids. They were 17 and 18. Kendra seemed to be so fake. Her laugh was never felt genuine. Holly says that her laugh was never genuine. Um, and then part 12 was called The Aftermath, and it's really just like a reunion special that brought everyone together. It brought together all the women, Sandra Theodore, who is his ex-girlfriend, um, Susie Krabicker, Lisa Loving Barrett, Audrey Ann Husky. They're all very heavily featured throughout the documentary. And so at the end, they all kind of come together and sit down and like actually kind of recap some of the experiences and um, the reaction from people. They got a lot of like heat from people being like, well, you you went there, you slept with him, you knew what you were doing, you knew what Playboy was all about. Like you can't, you know, cry victim now. Hef Sun has tweeted out uh, against the documentary saying that this is just people, you know, feeling guilty about the decisions that they made. They're, they have remorse. And so, that guilt that they have, they're trying to project it onto his father. And his father was always an honest and genuine man. I mean, it's his father. Obviously, he's going to, you know, he's going to, he's going to um, want to protect him, right? 
Okay. So curious what you guys thought. Those are all 12 parts. Like I said, it's available. I watched it on Peacock. It's available on Annie where it originally aired. I believe it's also available on Hulu live, not the regular Hulu, but Hulu live. Um, um, Miss Redhead says laced weed, not laced weed because I don't think they actually smoked weed. I believe they were just told that they were going to smoke weed, but they didn't actually do it. Um, let me, Excuse them. Well, let me give a couple more shout outs to people that just became members tonight. Okay. For, thanks, Sarah Bahu, Russ Davis. Actually, let's start from the top. Thank you, Ms. Red, for joining on NMD. Yep. Yep. Sarah Bahu, thank you for joining as a member on the YouTube. Love a good Zach Pack member. Hi, Russ Davis. Thank you for joining. Mary Ann Stout is a new member. Angela Woodham is a new member. You guys are the bomb.com. Thank you, guys. Muddy Grace, thank you guys for joining. I'm excited. This is going to be so fun. I'm planning all sorts of fun, exclusive content. Let me know what types of content you guys want as well. That's also, like, super important, too. So if there are very specific types, like, if you want more stories from Hollywood, if you want more behind-the-scenes vlogs, if you want... um. Like, let me know what types of content you want. I mean, obviously, after parties are going to be a big part of it. Shout outs will be a big part of it. You guys have special emojis. You guys get little badges next to your name now. So all of those things are available. So we can utilize them. But thank you guys for joining the members only. Love it. Jackie says, great job, Zach. Thank you. Um, have a good night. Need to run. Bye, Russ. Thank you for joining the members. And thank you for joining tonight. Okay, Mary Ann Stout says the twins are now very obese. They use food as comfort. I thought the same thing because when you saw them in recent years, they were very thin. And when you see them in the documentary, you can tell that they've gained a lot of weight, which did kind of make me think the same thing. Like maybe food was the way that they coped. Or I also thought that maybe not just food as a form of coping, but maybe um, gaining weight as a form of like abandoning that like I need to be this stick figure image that Hef wanted me to be. And maybe it was like a form of retaliation, you know, a form of rebellion of being like, you're not going to tell me what my body needs to be. Um, whether that was subconscious or that was intentional, I don't know, but it's, it's wild. Red Sox, Sarah, guys, yes, please hit the like button. Show me some love and support. I appreciate you guys. I'm here every Tuesday for book club. Um, I know what we initially were going to do Jeanette McCurdy's book. Um, I'm happy my mom died or something like that, but one, it doesn't, I don't know if it's all that topical anymore. I don't know if there's any interest in it anymore. And I heard that it wasn't that juicy that aside from what she revealed in, Ooh, weight is protection. That's a really good, good point. Shelly girl. I didn't even think of that. That's a really good point. I mean, I guess that goes back to my theory of like retaliation or rebellion, but protection is, I, I agree. Cause that you do. That is something that you hear with people that survived sexual trauma when they were younger, that sometimes they needed to protect themselves from being over-sexualized or from being taken advantage of. That's a good point. Um, I'm excited for you. You're fantastic to listen to. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Muddy Grace. Hef has always been shady. Look at what he did to Marilyn Monroe's photos. He released them after she died and is actually buried right next to her. It's so creepy. It's so creepy. And it was wild that, like, we idolized this man. We would dress up as him for Halloween. And, like, he was seen as, like, this, I don't even know. Protection is what I assumed. Yeah, Sarah Bahu. Thank you, Shelly girl, for the badges on the Instagram. Holla. All right, guys. Well, mm. thank you for joining tonight's book club. I will be doing, if there is a docu-series that you catch that you really like, I know Netflix has a lot of them that you want to do a breakdown of. We can do that on the members only. If you guys have a YouTube account and want to join, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you want to join our Zach Pack members only group, then you can head over to youtube.com slash just plain Zach J-U-S-T-P-L-A-I-N-Z-A-C-K. And there's a button right at the top right that says join now. And there you're able to join. Or I believe if you're on your phone, there's a tab that says memberships and you can join in there. Um, got lots of fun content that I'm planning. 
uh, behind the scenes content, maybe some vlogs that I might be doing when, you know, I'm hanging out with different reality stars. That might be kind of fun. I'll give you guys some early access to certain content. Um, all good stuff. All good stuff that I'm willing to share. After parties will be moved there. You know what happens at the after party? The tea always gets spilled there. I have a little sippy sippy of a little drinky drinky and we get really unfiltered. So you can head over to youtube.com slash just plain sack. Thanks, Zach. I have a meeting I've got to go to. Thanks, Linda. Enjoy your meeting, girl. Thank you for watching this crazy shit for us. Yeah, I would listen. I don't know if I would recommend anybody watch it. It's so heavy and it's so dark and it's like, oof. No matter what book, we all are Zach fans and deserve the like. He's amazing. Thank you, Red Sox, Sarah. Um, yes, guys. So next week, next Tuesday, we'll be back at our regular time. Tuesday. 5.30 p.m. Pacific, 8.30 Eastern, live on Instagram at No Filter with Zach and live on YouTube at youtube.com slash just plain Zach. We'll be live here and we'll be breaking down Meghan Markle's book. I think the goal is to do five chapters a week of the Meghan Markle book. It's very long. It's very, very long. So the goal is going to be to do five chapters. And if anyone's reading along with me, that's a chapter a day. You get two days off between now and next Tuesday. So we have that as options. If you guys want to join that, it'll be fun. I hear the book is very juicy and very expository and really reveals, really, really reveals that, that Meghan Markle character. Boo, long books. Well, that's why we make it simpler, Miles. It's a long book, but we're going to condense it and we make it fun. We have a drink. We come here. It's a long book. So it'll be eight weeks because we'll, if we do five chapters a week, then that'll be broken up over to eight weeks. Listen, that'll give us some fun content. So at least until we decide what the next book is going to be after the Meghan Markle book. But I hear this one is juicy. So get ready. All right, guys. I love you. I appreciate you. Have a wonderful night. Ooh, Jean. Oh, uh, Janan. Janine. Janine Bet. Janine Bet. Yes. From Glasgow, Scotland. What's going on, Glasgow, Scotland? Gay simplicity and juicy is good. Yes, juicy is good. All right, guys, I love you. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful um, rest of your week. And I'll talk to you on Thursday for our next uh, Thursday Night Live. All right. Oh, and we got the Aspen trip in Beverly Hills with Erica. And Erica is like, I don't care about anybody else but me. That's going to be wild. Okay. Okay. Good night, guys. Love you. Mean it. Ciao for now. Bye. Bye, Miles. Bye, guys. Bye, 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 bye. Oh, Jen and Bet. Jen and Bet. Jen and Bet. Well, thank you, Jen and. Okay. Good night, guys. Love you. Mean it. Bye. Bye, 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 bye. Good night, guys. Bye, Mary. Bye, Aaron. Bye, Tia. Bye, Muddy.